All right. Uh, welcome. My name is Ryan Fox. The title of this talk is To Infinity and Beyond. Uh, we're going to talk about computer vision and image processing, how they're used in astronomy uh, and in other applications. This is where you can find me on the internet. Uh, I work with uh, companies in astronomy and aerospace and drones doing software development. Uh, so I use image processing and computer vision a lot. I'm going to explain what those mean and how you can use them in a little bit. Uh, not everything in this talk is going to be astronomy related, but a lot of earthbound techniques use the same application, uh, applications use the same techniques. Uh, the goal of this talk is to give you an idea of what's possible, uh, what exists, what you can do with it, uh, and how you can use it in applications you're developing. Uh, this talk is going to be three main parts. The first is image processing, and we'll work our way from lowest level building up to high level, more complex tasks, move into computer vision, more of the same, and then how you can use it beyond the end of this talk. First, we have to take a little detour into how computers actually see. Uh, raster images are stored often as a two dimensional matrix. Uh, usually you get 8 bits per pixel, uh, 0 being pure black and 255 being pure white. Uh, the darker your pixel, uh, the darker your value, the darker your pixel, uh, it's just a direct mapping. This is a single channel image, grayscale. You're not restricted to one channel though. Uh, it's common to get three channels, red, green, blue. This is uh, the format most of the images you encounter on a day, to day basis are. Uh, you have a separate channel each for red, green, blue, but you can change the color space so you also, uh, during processing, you might operate in different color spaces. Uh, you're also not restricted to just three channels. There's a format commonly used in astronomy called FITS, where you can store a raster image uh, and have basically as many channels as you want because it's fairly common to take an image of the same object uh, at many different wavelengths. Uh, the important thing to remember from this is that any operation you want to apply to an image, you can apply to one channel, or all three channels, or all, all channels. Uh, now to explain what I meant by image processing versus computer vision. If you talk to ten different people, you're probably going to get ten different answers. There's no hard definition. But uh, for the purposes of this talk, when I say image processing, I mean something operating on a low level. Uh, versus computer vision, you want to get more intelligence about what's in that image or photo. Uh, image processing uh, algorithms usually are working on a pixel by pixel basis. Uh, in computer vision, you're more concerned with an image holistically. Uh, a lot of image processing things we're going to talk about you won't actually directly use, but they're components in a larger pipeline. Uh, usually the goal of computer vision is to get some knowledge about an image or photo. Uh, and be able to do something with that, uh, whether that's label it or uh, use, use it as part of a larger set. A lot of times for an image processing algorithm, the input is an image, obviously, but the output is another image that's been transformed in some way. With computer vision, your input is also an image, but you might not get an image out. You might get uh, information about that image on, on a broad level. Uh, what the image contains, uh, what it's a picture of, more or less. Uh, just as, as an example, uh, this is uh, the same picture fed through two algorithms. On the left, there's an, it's been processed by an edge detection algorithm. Uh, and on the right, it's been processed by an object detection algorithm. On the left, we don't really care what's in an image. We just want to find the boundaries of what objects are in it and where. Uh, and on the right, we don't particularly care about what color it is, what way it's facing, uh, where the actual lines in it are outside of the general region in the image where it is. Uh, it gets labeled with a car. We're about 64% sure that's the case. I think it did all right on that one. Uh, if you're going to be using Python for computer vision, use OpenCV. It's a fantastic library. Uh, it lives at opencv.org. It's written in C++. There are Python bindings, but it's kind of a pain to build and import the objects into what you want. There is a package on the Python package index called OpenCV Python. 
if you're not interested in using it for uh, C, plus, C or C++ applications, you can just pip install this and it gets you pre-compiled binaries. So uh, easy one step installation. Once you've got it, just import it as usual. Uh, this is how you read an image. And then once you have it imported uh, under the hood, it is stored as a NumPy array. So it plays fairly nicely with NumPy, SciPy, uh, and Pillow, which is another imaging library in Python. Uh, if you haven't used that one, it's also pretty nice. And then once you're done with whatever you're doing, it's also easy to save uh, basically any image operation you want on top of the ones we're going to talk about. So that gets us to the image processing portion of our talk. We're going to run down this set of features. We're not going to go too heavy on math, but uh, just your takeaway you want is to have an idea of what it is and how it, it works on a broad level. So first up is convolution. Uh, you, this is a low, low level building block for a lot of uh, image processing applications. Don't worry about all this. <laughs> Basically what you want to rem uh, remember is this is a lot of times how a filter is applied to an image. This is uh, used as a, sorry, uh, this, you have a, your large image and then a small, maybe three by three or five by five matrix uh, you use to apply a filter uh, stepping across pixel by pixel. That filter is called the kernel. Um, that's about all you need to remember from that. Here's how roughly it works. Uh, on the left we have our image. In the middle we have our kernel. You set the kernel down in the top left. You go element-wise and multiply by the weights in the kernel with your pixel value. And then at the end, you add them all up. Uh, once you're done with that, you have to divide by the sum of the values in the kernel just so your image doesn't get brighter every time as you're multiplying and adding all these numbers up. And then the pixel in the middle of the kernel on the left, you store here in the uh, output image. Once you have that step done, slide it over one and repeat and do the same thing. Uh, what va particular values you pick for your kernel is going to change what the operation does. Uh, this particular kernel is, has the effect of blurring an image. This is the cat eye nebula. Uh, on the left is uh, the, fi the final uh, product uh, that's been released by NASA. And applying that kernel gets you this. Uh, so that's nice. Okay, we can blur images, but why would you ever want to do that? It seems like you're kind of throwing away information. Uh, well, one useful property that blurring it has is reduces noise. You can see there's a lot of stars in the background on the left, not so much on the right. So that's going to be useful for feature extraction. Uh, this is basically detecting shapes in an image, uh, whether that's lines, circles, corners, edges. Uh, OpenCV has a lot of built-in features for this. Uh, first up, we have edge detection. Uh, the one OpenCV has is called the canny edge detector. First step, it blurs the image. Uh, second is it calculates the gradient, which is just the change uh, in intensity, uh, direction and magnitude in a particular region. Uh, once you have that done, uh, if you, you look at each smaller region of the image, uh, if it's a place with a low gradient, maybe you're in kind of in a sea of flat color, not really an edge. Uh, if you are in a place with a high gradient, maybe you're changing from one color to another or light to dark. That's something a human would probably describe as an edge. Uh, here's a picture of the Hubble telescope. You can see this one did pretty well. Uh, some of the solar panels, we got fairly good lines and even banding around the bottom of the telescope. Uh, on the front of the telescope, though, it's kind of a mess. But to be fair, if you gave a human that sub picture and asked him to find the edges, there's not much to go off. Uh, we can also detect corners. Uh, this is also fairly noisy. Uh, all these operations are going to have parameters that you can tune. And what you choose depends on your application, really. What your tolerance to noise is going to be uh, false positive rate, false negative rate. So really, you have to see what's going to work with your data set. Uh, we can see here, still found all, pretty much anything you would describe as a corner on the solar panels, uh, the radio dishes. And then along the telescope, notice not on the sunshade, except on that little notch on the top. We have a smooth curve there, uh, and it thankfully passed those over. 
Uh, moving on, we have a Huff transform. This is how you can detect lines or circles uh, in an image. Same thing. We look at Hubble. We found our solar panel lines pretty well. And then again, a lot of the noise. You can see, depending on your image, it's not always going to give you a great result. Uh, you kind of have to play with it and see what works a lot of times. Uh, finding lines in an image is often useful for real, real world applications. This is sort of the first one where it has a real world mapping. Uh, if you are programming a self-driving car and you want to stay in your lane, <laughs> you might put a camera facing forward out the front of the car and ideally you want to see a, lane, a line on either side converging toward the middle. If you've got one below you or maybe two off to the same side, you want to rectify that situation. Uh, next up is feature descriptors. Uh, if you just gave a picture, of a, a picture to a human and asked them to describe it, you could use some words, but that's not very useful to a computer. So this is a way to quantitatively fingerprint uh, a region of interest so you can compare it to other regions. Uh, OpenCV comes with a bunch of different classifiers that all have different properties. Uh, different uh, processing speed, uh, whether they're susceptible to rotations or scale changes, color, skewing, and warping. These two, SIFT and SURF, I'm going to mention for historical purposes mostly, they were some of the original really accurate ones that opened the door to show what could be done really. Unfortunately, they're patent encumbered. They are still in open CD, so you can try them out if you want, but uh, it might be a little risky. Luckily, OpenCV has a bunch of other ones, uh, all with the pros and cons, all not uh, patent encumbered. Uh, we're going to talk about ORB, which is a two-step process. ORB is, stands for Oriented Fast and Rotated Brief. Fast and Brief, of course, stand for something else. <laughs> it's a two-step process. Fast is a feature point detector, so it's going to locate edges, corners, places that might be described well in an image and then brief actually describes them. Uh, rotated alludes to the fact that it's supposed to handle rotated images fairly well. So if we have a picture of Tranquility Base, uh, if you asked a human to find some points where you could maybe line up another image with that, uh, what do you have to go on? Maybe the antenna on top of the spacesuit, the equipment on the ground, the flag, the lunar lander. Uh, it's kind of hard to see at this resolution, but uh, with the feature point detector applied, it did find the top of the antenna. There's some on the spacesuit. Found three corners of the flag, so it does all right. Uh, once we can describe where an image is, we're going to talk about image segmentation. This is basically splitting an image into multiple sections, uh, like a region of interest. The simplest way to segment an image is thresholding. Uh, you just pick a threshold value, and all pixels above that you take it to be 1, and all pixels below that you take to be 0. You can threshold on anything you want, pretty much. Uh, intensity or color are pretty common. Uh, if we wanted to segment this image to get our astronaut out of the sky, uh, the background behind him is pretty dark. He's really bright, a lot of white pixels in there. The Earth's kind of somewhere in the middle, and there are some clouds, so we might have to deal with those separately. Uh, if you play around with your threshold, see what you can get, uh, you can come up with this. This is just a binary mask now. Once you have your image segmented, a lot of times it's useful to use erosion and dilation. This is basically going to make your, the white portion of your mask grow or shrink. Uh, so if you dilate it, it's going to fill in holes like a lot of these shadows in the spacesuit. Uh, erosion does the opposite. A lot of the tiny little specks will be uh, washed away. Uh, it's important which order you do it in uh, because it's coming to use them in tandem. Uh, if you erode, then dilate, that's going to eliminate noise. So if you have speckles in the background, those get washed away by the erosion. Well, then they're gone so they don't come back with dilation. If you do dilation first, then erosion, it's going to do the opposite and maybe fill in some of these rivers in the big picture. Here's some successive erosions applied. You can see that the spacesuit does kind of wear away, but also the clouds from upper right to upper left to lower right got much fainter. And then the opposite, this is what dilation looks like. Uh, a lot of those shadows on the spacesuit are filled in, but then also the clouds are getting stronger too. Once you have your image segmented, you want to do something with that. So selecting a contour is 
common way to do that. It's basically picking out a shape. Uh, it's usually what we're after uh, as the final step when we're segmenting an image. OpenCV will find all the contours in, image, in an image. So you'll get one uh, blob for the spacesuit, another one for this cloud, another one for this cloud. Uh, it's common to sort them by size, and then you know the guy taking the spacewalk is likely to be the biggest one. And then if you combine that mask with your original image, you can select out just his pixels. Histograms are another way to separate an image. It, uh, it works by putting pixel intensities into bins. So you get a graph uh, with dark pixels on the left, bright pixels on the right, uh, and the number at each intensity. Here's what the histogram for Hubble uh, looks like. NumPy has this. OpenCV also has histogram functions. Uh, you can see there's a lot of dark pixels. This is a log scale, so we're talking on the order of a, m a million pushing 10 million uh, dark ones, and then a handful, around 10,000, really bright uh, on the sunshade and reflecting on the barrel. Now, this is a picture of the Eagle Nebula. It's a fantastic image. This is not what an image that comes down from Hubble looks like. That's what an image that comes down from Hubble looks like. <laughs> Uh, astronomers are operating on low signal to noise ratio a lot of time, so how can we improve this? So this is the histogram for this image. Uh, if you can see the numbers there on the left of the scale, that's 10 to the 8. So we're pushing 100 million gray pixels and <coughs> basically nothing else. You can see there's a few bright specks, so some stars shining through, but not much. Histogram equalization basically takes this and forces it to conform to uh, a more regular shape, uh, oftentimes a normal curve or something approximating that. Uh, now, there's been more processing steps that went from uh, side A to side B, but you can see there's a lot of detail there that is totally invisible in the original. That's one of them, yes. <laughs> there's been more exposures combined. Uh, image registration is a fancy term for lining up images. <laughs> uh, you might have to deal with translations or rotations or perspective changes. There's two main uses. Uh, one for making a bigger picture, increasing your field of view, and two for increasing clarity uh, and maintaining the same picture size. Uh, panoramas, uh, people pretty uh, intuitively understand. Your phone does it probably. Uh, you take multiple images. You can see this one's three. Uh, once they're registered, you can kind of blend over the edges and then get a larger picture. Uh, one issue is that you can uh, get a lot of distortion toward the edges, so there are ways to deal with even wider ones than this. If you're familiar with this image, this was taken by Hubble. This is actually a panorama. It's called the Hubble Deep Field. Uh, they pointed the telescope at an empty patch of sky and exposed for days and days and days to see what was there. Uh, and then when they looked at the end, this is what they got. Now, Hubble isn't actually one camera. This is a composite of four. That's why you have the strange shape in the upper right. That detector is smaller than the others. If you look closely, you can see some seams around the middle, too. Uh, that brings us to the other way you might want to, or the other reason you might want to register some images is stacking. Uh, instead of increasing your field of view, this is going to increase the fidelity of your image. Uh, when you take any given image, uh, if it's for astronomy, you can have a lot of sources of noise. Uh, much of this is inescapable. And then even if you're photographing stuff around your backyard, maybe someone walked in front of the thing you were taking a picture of, a family portrait, someone blinks. What can you do about that? Well, if you take a lot of pictures of the same thing, a uh, kitchen table in this case, with a stray dry erase marker walking across, <laughs> If you apply feature point, uh, feature detector to it, you can line those all up. And then on each pixel alignment, you stack them up and then take them, sort them and take the median value. The idea is that if you had bright pixels, uh, say a cosmic ray or something, uh, those will rise to the top of the stack and dark pixels will fall to the bottom. Uh, along with thermal noise, anything else, hopefully it will average out over your run of shots. So ideally, the middle pixel leaves you with something uh, approximating the ground truth, yeah. Is there enough uh, dynamic contrast in there to see that the marker in all five images once stacked is a outlier in the medium? Or is there enough additional data that you can look at if that is calculated in the medium to see too much of five of those marks in the medium? 
if you look really close, you can actually see some ghosts. Uh, the fix for that is take more pictures. <laughs> Well, the hope is that if you have some random noise or a transient uh, error, uh, the more pictures you take, the more of them are going to contain uh, the true image that you're looking for. Uh, so if you, your signal is just totally washed out and you can't even get uh, a solid image in half of them, uh, you might not have much luck. Yeah. You can, yeah. A lot of uh, a lot of applications deal with rotations or translations. Once you have them lined up, that's really all you need. Uh, you can resample a pixel grid, so it's uh, everything is rectified on top of each other, and then you just have a list of num uh, integer values. So you take the median. Uh, the left picture is a crop from one of the original ones. The right one is the finished product. This was never actually taken from a camera. It's just composed of the other five. Uh, I don't know how good our quality is here, but you can see uh, there's quite a bit of noise reduced, and it's a lot less grainy. Now we're kind of crossing over into computer vision territory. We're going to talk about higher level techniques, uh, what you can do with them. First up is object detection. Uh, really, this is the problem of given an image, how can you find that in another image? Uh, this relates to registration, if you might have one of those rotations. Uh, OpenCV has a handful of ways to do this. Feature matching is going to rely heavily on those feature descriptors we talked about. Uh, histogram back, back projection uh, uh, is a process where you take the histogram of your sub-image and compare it to regions uh, on the larger image. Uh, so you get a probability that that picture came from the original. Hard cascades and neural nets are both useful for this thing. They're also useful for object recognition in general. So instead of finding one particular instance of, say, a cat, you find any cat. Uh, this is a wheel from the Curiosity rover, currently on Mars. Uh, if you apply that, apply that orb feature detector, you can see uh, pick up a handful on the treads, and then also some on the chassis of the rover. Not much on the dirt. Uh, that's pretty good because uh, it's fairly uniform. We don't want to we don't want to key on too much there. Here's the original image it came from. Uh, the way uh, feature detector matching is going to work is it takes finds the feature points in your sub image and finds the feature points points in your larger image. Uh, and to a computer, those are just numbers, so it can plot them. And then for all the feature points in your smaller image, it looks for its nearest neighbors. If it finds a region in a larger image where a lot of those are close matches, then you've probably got consensus that that's where it came from. OpenCV lets you draw the matches even, and you can see that the uh, feature points on the chassis match up fairly well, and then also ones on the treads. The lines are pretty thin, but uh, it does line up well. Now, Orb is supposed to handle rotations. Uh, you can see the feature points in our match up there are still on the chassis, and they cut across and do match up on the other ones. So. Orb functioning today. Uh, object recognition I touched on a little earlier. Uh, this is about matching any given instance of an object. Uh, two main, there's two popular ways to do this. Uh, cascade classifier, uh, one of those is called the Har classifier. That uses known characteristics. Neural nets are really great at this too, but one of their shortcomings is we don't really know how they do what they do. Uh, so hard cascades uh, operate under the assumption that a lot of pictures of, for example, uh, human faces have a lot of the same characteristics, at least in photographs. Uh, light generally is coming from above you, so it hits your forehead, which is lighter than your eyes, and it also illuminates your cheekbones. So there's a, a set of filters that get set up to compare regions on an image to how well it stacks up against those. Uh, now, it's important to know that one built into OpenCV wasn't trained specifically on Neil at all. It just uses those characteristics. Uh, the one, the one OpenCV is bundled with has, I think, on the order of 6,000. Uh, when you run it, hooray, it found Neil. Hard cascades tend to be fairly fast uh, relative to neural nets. They can be, neural nets are fairly performant, but they take more time, usually. 
uh, and can take a lot of memory as well. Yeah. Depends what your uh, phone is or camera. Uh, they use both ways. A lot of uh, neural nets are a relatively recent development. Uh, they've, been, uh, they've been showing a lot of promise and they're getting better all the time. Uh, OpenCV also comes with uh, other feature detectors bundled in. Uh, there's, this is, was detected using the frontal face detector. There's also one for faces in profile. Uh, and a pretty cute one is there's one for cats as well. Someone got that pull request accepted. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's talk about a different kind of problem, uh, reverse image search. So instead of looking for an image inside another image, given an image, what is it a picture of? Uh, like, the, say, the Eiffel Tower or George Washington. Uh, this is a service, astrometry.net, uh, provided to the public. Uh, their mission is given a picture of anything in the night sky. Where is it? What are you looking at? Which is a phenomenally hard sounding problem at least. Uh, this is one taken from their archives. Now, if you're familiar with a lot of deep space objects, you might know where this is. But if I cropped out that segment in the middle, you might, be, uh, you might have a hard time. So what can we do to figure out where this picture is? Uh, the way astrometry.net works, uh, broadly speaking, is finds the brightest stars and then it's going to map a set of triangles over them. Uh, now triangles, the angles and side lengths, the ratios between side lengths, aren't going to change when you zoom in or rotate. So that gives you a stable uh, feature, so to speak, to search on. Once you have a set that characterizes your image, you can search a catalog of known distances and angles between bright stars. This is the annotated version. Uh, we can see it found uh, the big nebula. It also located an object on some of the brighter point sources. And then this uh, brightest one in the bottom is labeled Alnitak, uh, which is also Zeta Orionis uh, in the Orion constellation. Uh, if you're familiar with the Horsehead Nebula, you know that's in Orion, so found the right spot. So that's cool, but what if we can't calculate triangles? What if you just want to find another image? Uh, you could do a feature point search, but that's going to be prohibitively time expensive over a large uh, image set. One way to deal with that is something called a perceptual, perceptual hash. If you're familiar with cryptography hashes, a uh, desirable property is for every bit you change in the input, you want the output to change a lot. So you can't tell that you guessed close to a password. You just want to be able to tell yes or no. Uh, image hashes, we want to have the opposite property. If we change it a little bit, we don't want it to change much uh, given lossy compression. Uh, if you strip off one row of pixels, the image hasn't really changed, but uh, a computer wouldn't necessarily see it that way. So these are three images. Uh, the two on the left are different. They were taken a second or two apart. Uh, if you look closely, you can see some of the waves have moved in the boats in the background. The one on the right is substantially different, but not a ton. Uh, there's quite a bit more green grass. So how can we get a hash that'll tell us the two on the left are equivalent, or at least close, and the one on the right is meh, not so much. Uh, there's one called dehash. There's another, uh, there's several other hashes. This one in particular is uh, the one I found to be the best performing. Uh, it's a fairly simple algorithm. Convert your image to grayscale, simple enough. Resize it down to a very small size, uh, something on the order of 8 by 8. And then iterate over each pixel. You just look at its neighbor uh, in one direction. Pick, it doesn't really matter. You just have to be consistent. And you look if the next pixel is brighter or darker. If it's brighter, uh, you, put down, you write down 1. If it's darker, you write down 0. So at the end of your 60, 64 pixels, you have 64 bits, uh, which is a number. Computers are good at dealing with those. You can see here, uh, you can still see the original image somewhat. There's uh, light water at the top with the sun reflecting off, a very bright path at the bottom. Everything else is kind of muddled the same. These are the dehashes of those three images. Uh, the two on the left did hash out to the exact same value, so win there. And the third one, uh, not so much. Dehash also allows for fuzzy matching, so you don't have to have an exact match to tell that uh, the images are close. Hamming distance is the distance, uh, the number of different bits between two strings. 
Uh, there's a library on the Python package index that uh, makes it fairly easy to use these as well. Uh, you feed it an image and it spits out a number. Uh, optical character recognition isn't used so much in astronomy, but uh, it's useful for a lot of earthly applications. Uh, neural nets have made a lot of big strides here. Uh, one of the big uh, engines for this is called Tesseract. It's backed by Google currently. The latest version uses something called the LSTM, which stands for Long Short Term Memory. It's a kind of neural net. It's an interesting name on that one. Uh, there is Python support for this with PyTesseract. Uh, again, fairly simple. You feed it an image, it tells you what words are in it. Uh, QR codes are a special kind of barcode, uh, two two-dimensional barcode. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with the three big blocks in the upper left, uh, the upper corners and the lower left corner. Uh, those are for location, so when you have an image, the algorithm will key in on the location of a QR code based on that. There's also uh, alignment blocks. Uh, you can see in the lower right there is a, a clear space around a single pixel there and then as you add more and more image to a QR code uh, they actually expand and this one has several alignment blocks. Uh, those are for rectifying the image so if you are, the picture is taken at an angle you can square it up and read those pixels out. Uh, photogrammetry Yes, it's possible. So if you have a, a key point detector or uh, some, geometry, some geometry that's known ahead of time, uh, you can compute the transformation between those two. Uh, so for example, if you, I don't know, a sheet of paper, you know is going to have right angles. Uh, if you look at the, the angles of the lines, you can figure out how that was skewed uh, and project it back onto a 90 degree surface. So yes, they do have uses outside of QR codes, but that's a prominent one. Uh, we're actually going to come up to something on that shortly. Uh, photogrammetry, in general, is me getting physical measurements from imagery. Uh, drones are really suited well to this. Uh, you can use satellites for it, but they are very high up and they cost a lot. So you're probably not going to use one. On the other hand, drone hardware is getting better and cheaper all the time. Uh, there's software where you can get a Google Maps style view uh, of your local neighborhood and trace out a area and it'll automatically canvas it. Uh, so once you have this set of pictures, what can you do with it? We can generate a map uh, or an ortho mosaic, which is kind of a map on steroids. So usually when you stitch a panorama, you want to blend all the seams together, uh, but that warps your image so you can't necessarily calculate an angle or distance accurately. An ortho mosaic is the same thing, but with those distances preserved. Uh, you can see here there's some gaps uh, at the top and bottom. Usually that indicates there was a tall structure or uh, a large slope on the ground maybe where the drone couldn't get eyes on that side of the object. Uh, it would just kind of get washed out as parallax artifact in a panorama, but not so much on an ortho mosaic. Uh, with point clouds, uh, you can also generate a point cloud, so that gets you 3D modeling. So you can make a contour map, you can do area or volume measurements. Uh, you can also use these kind of things for terrain classification. So you might want to separate this image into a field area and a wooded area, and then uh, the house. This is what the point cloud looks like. Uh, one, uh, another recognition task in some of these projects is ground control points. Basically, you have a big tile you throw it on the ground that acts as a QR code. Uh, once the image processing software sees that, you tie that to a known reference location in the real world, and that can help your accuracy out. It's kind of hard to see from one static image uh, of a 3D point cloud, but you can kind of get the idea that the woods go up from the house a little bit, and then also the ground slopes off down here. So that's about what you would expect from looking at that ortho mosaic. Uh, neural networks are useful for a lot of stuff. They are starting to get incorporated in OpenCV, but they haven't been too much yet. Uh, they're useful for a broad array of tasks, image classification, given an image, what is it a picture of, uh, object recognition, uh, locating those objects in the image. YOLO stands for you only look once. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, OCR, they're really good at a lot more stuff as well. So here's an example of image classification. Just give a picture. What is in it? Uh, we got a lot of people. There's grass. It's outside. Yeah, pretty well. Uh, fits pretty well. Some of the uh, lower probability matches are interesting. Although umbrella, you can kind of see where it got that from. Uh, and then object recognition localizes objects in an image. Uh, you can detect, sure, it has cars, but where are they? Uh, people, multiple classes, that sort of thing. So now that ends the tour of our uh, computer vision portion of the talk. So let's talk about how you can use this in real life. Uh, now that you know some building blocks, you can see kind of how those can be composed into a pipeline. Maybe you want to load an image, uh, select some object classes in it, uh, and send that off somewhere else. Or uh, load a bunch of images and create a panorama. Uh, there's a lot of libraries, library support for this sort of stuff. OpenCV, as mentioned, all talk is great. Uh, there's a lot of APIs for this stuff, too. So if you don't want to deal with implementing it on the back end, uh, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, AWS all have some applications, uh, some APIs for you to use. If you're interested in astronomy data processing, AstroPy is great. It's under active development. Uh, it works well with those FITS files I mentioned earlier. If you want to do stacking, uh, this is a, another free program, Deep Sky Stacker. There's a lot in this space, but that's just one that I've found is nice. Uh, Hugin is an image uh, panorama stitching. Uh, application. It's nice because it's scriptable. Uh, and then if you're interested in more of the drone side, there is a uh, newcomer on the block called Open Drone Map. That'll do a lot of that uh, orthomosaic and point cloud operations. Actually, I need to take a step back. Uh, I kind of glossed over this slide a little bit. This looks like pseudocode, but it's not actually pseudocode. This is code from a project I've been working on. Uh, I mentioned I work a lot with drones, and a lot of those missions involve repetitive tasks, kind of doing the same thing over and over. Well, what do programmers do with automated uh, repetitive tasks? We automate them. So I wrote a programming language. Uh, it's called DIL for Drone Imaging Language. It lives here on GitHub. Uh, this is a domain-specific language, so meaning uh, it's not intended to be used for general purpose programming. It has one specific niche. Uh, these examples actually came from DIL. This is a panorama of downtown Milwaukee. It's one of those 360 degree panoramas. Uh, DIL can create, uh, can create the panorama and then put it in a nice web viewer so you can look around, pan around, zoom in. Uh, and then this is me flying on a mission actually. Uh, the, the object detection is done with a neural network based on YOLO. So imagine the question a lot of you have for me right now is why? <laughs> uh, why write a language for this? Why not just a Python library or even just a script? And when I talk to programmers a lot of times about programming language, I ask, oh, have you developed any? Because uh, I'm interested in languages. And I get this blank look. Or no, I've never even considered it. Or they don't think they have the technical chops. And I don't think that's true. So there's three aspects of domain-specific languages I think lend themselves well to this project. Um, the first is that domain-specific languages don't have to be complex. If you think about a general purpose language like Python or Java or JavaScript, there's a lot of grammar there. Uh, if you had to write a parser, that's a really heavyweight task. Python itself has some of these built into it. The date-time formatting spec, uh, if you've ever tried to deal with if date dot month equals equals four string plus equals April, that's a nightmare. Uh, you, instead, you just give it a format string, put all your symbols in you want, and then out comes a nice human readable date. Regular expressions are another domain specific language. Uh, they're great at parsing text. They're also kind of infamous for not being great when you try to apply them outside their domain. Uh, now you have two problems. Uh, there's one, another one, Python. Like in the documentation, it's called the string formatting mini language. Uh, if you want to inject some values into a string, maybe format a number nicely, uh, this helps you do that. If you remember the left pad debacle from node.js, uh, it's nice to have something like this in your standard library. The second aspect is that domain-specific languages trade general, generality for simplicity. 
Uh, this is the entire DIL. It has five commands. They're all fairly self-explanatory. Uh, you can load a set of images or an image. You can highlight some object classes in that image. You can stitch a panorama. You can show that panorama in a web browser. And you can save your results. That's it. When I was implementing it, I didn't have to worry about recursion or branching or uh, memory storage, anything. Uh, just keeping the spec small enables you to have a narrow focus when you're developing it. And the third is that languages are interfaces. Uh, programmers like to maintain and talk about separation concerns or keeping the design separate from the implementation of something. Uh, Python's a case of this. There's the C Python implementation, but also PyPy, uh, Jython, Iron Python, and some others. They implement the same language, but they're different under the hood. Uh, by designing the language to be separate, by, by designing a language rather than a Python class that forces this implementation to be separate. Uh, a lot of imaging tasks are what could be called embarrassingly parallel. Uh, for example, a 2017 desktop grade processor might have four or eight cores, uh, and a roughly equivalent GPU might have 2,000. That's just due to the nature of images. You'd, like if you want to render a pixel, you don't have to go consult five other ones before you do that. Uh, so if you wanted to, you could re-implement the DIL in a way to take advantage of this if you had a really large data set to chew through. Uh, and then lastly, uh, creating interfaces, joining them together, using interfaces is a programmer's sock and trade. You're already doing that pretty much every day. Uh, so the next time you find yourself needing to implement an API, while I'm a big fan of using the right tool for the job, uh, don't necessarily dismiss it out of hand. Uh, it's not necessarily as difficult as you think. Uh, that wraps up our talk. Here's where you can find me on the internet. And thank you for listening. Yeah. Sure. Right. So the question is, was, if I understand you right, uh, how do you quantify or you have to still know about the error bounds on your noise, right? Yeah, that's a difficult question in general. Uh, a lot of astronomy operates right at the margin uh, of signal to noise. Um, a, lot of, a lot of preparation goes into uh, setting up an observation. Uh, you can have generally have an idea of your instrument, what kind of noise you can expect, and what you're observing. That you ex yeah, what you expect to get from the object. Uh, sometimes you don't get anything. You know, sometimes you just get noise. Well, I was just wondering if uh, there is some sort of quantification that you know when you put it in an image. You're saying that this particular image is a plus or minus five percent, or something like that. That's what you're interpreting. Basically. Sure, uh, there is. There's, for basically every observatory, there's been a lot of work in characterizing the instrument itself. So they have a pretty good handle on the error bars of the entire system. You're talking about this guy, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so the question was about importing uh, uh, raw files from a digital camera. As far as I know, there isn't anything in OpenCV for that, but it handles TIFF formats. And there's an application called DC Raw, which will convert basically any raw into a TIFF. Pillow also does it? OK. Try Pillow then also, potentially. Yeah. So I remember seeing a program where they Yes, yeah, so uh, asking about using over and underexposed images along with the regular exposure. 
That's called HDR imaging, high dynamic range. So back at the start when we talked about uh, 8 bits per pixel per channel, so you have 24-bit color. Uh, that's nice, but that's not a ton of dynamic range. If you take another picture, so if that's your standard picture, and you take another one overexposed and underexposed, underexposed you can expand that. Uh, so a common example is in a, a room, indoor room with some direct sunlight coming in the windows. Uh, if you take a regular exposure, the windows will just be blown out and totally white. Uh, if you take another ex image with the exposure cranked down, you get a regular exposure outside of the window, but everything inside is dark. So if you align those images, you can take the nice, the well-behaved parts of each of them. Uh, HDR is uh, something you can Google if you're interested in learning more about that. That's built into a lot of cameras nowadays, actually. Yeah. Uh, so about how many lines of code is necessary to make most of your examples? Like, is it just like one-liners, or it doesn't take you at all? So you're talking about? Like putting, uh, like how many points, or yeah. Sure, like some of the OpenCV examples. Yeah. Uh, not many, you know, maybe on the order of 10. Okay. So loading the images, a line, and then OpenCV actually has a blur function, so that's one more line. And then if you want to save it out or show or something. Some of the more complex ones, like uh, finding features, let me come to that one. Well, there we go. Uh, th those are going to be a little more set up because you're dealing with multiple images. Uh, you have to create a detection object and then map between them. Still not more than maybe 15 or 20 lines. I'm a consultant, so I work with companies that use video or imagery in their products. Uh, I've worked with uh, a couple of astronomy observatories. Uh, I worked with the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. They run the VLA, which is out in New Mexico. If you've seen the movie Contact, uh, the, the satellite dishes out in the desert. That's a real place. It's a working observatory. And I've also worked on the James Webb Space Telescope. Yes. No. <laughs> no one touches the telescope. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. Luminance HDR. Anyone else? Yeah. Okay, so um, what happens if you're doing like long exposure time, not long exposure time, but low key enhancing over time where you start getting shadows or light um, in these images? Time lapse. Yeah, time lapse stuff. Um, sure. How do you maintain um, recognition in between uh, those different frames of the object that's there that are getting those shades? Sure. That's a fairly difficult problem in general uh, if you have. Aligning images that are that have drastic changes, um, you probably want to try out different feature descriptors and see which one works the best for you. Uh, it's easy to write or come up with a bad feature descriptor. Uh, the good ones have been pretty uh, babble tested. I have a lot of research going into them, so I would say probably try the. Um, I would say probably run through the uh, ones available in OpenCV, uh, these guys, and see which one works best for your data set. And these ones have different properties um, depending what kind of changes you want to be. Uh, you want to count as a positive or negative result. Uh, yeah, uh, my website is foxrow.com. I'll put them up. They're not up yet. I'll put them up uh, in the coming days. All right, I think that wraps up our time. So thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs>